Okay, thank you. It's a, a great honor to be back here at the Utah Winter Finance Conference. I think this is like my 25th time. The conference has been on a little bit longer, um, but I owe several thanks here. First, to my co-authors, who have been outstanding, uh, Zunke Bar Bartram and Yash Nazawa. Uh, I also, I know that Avner just stepped out of the room, but uh, great thank you to Avner and Jim, uh, Jennifer for putting on a great conference, not just this year, but for more than 30 years. Uh, and, and mostly because you've helped so many of us develop great, deep friendships with many people in, the, in our profession, and uh, I deeply appreciate that. All right, so this is a paper about book to market. It's one of the more prominent anomalies in uh, equities. Uh, we're going to study book to market here for bonds, and I'm not talking about equity book to market, the book value of equity divided by the market value of equity, I'm going to be talking about what I call the bond book to market ratio, which I'll uh, define uh, shortly. We're going to find that this bond book to market ratio predicts bond returns, um, and it does so controlling for uh, everything under the sun. And I've struggled much of my career trying to understand whether these anomalies, there's more than 300 anomalies for equities, whether some of them are really due to omitted risk factors, due to liquidity, or due to behavioral explanations. And I confess, as old as I am, that I still don't really have an answer for equities. And partly that's because I don't really understand how to value equities, despite being a finance professor. I understand that theoretically, but when it comes to actually looking at an individual stock, I don't really know what its fair value is. Bonds are a little bit different. They're simpler. The future cash flows of the bonds, some, you know, they're promised, so there's some benchmark there against, we can, against which we can measure some bonds against others. The problem with studying bonds, however, is that they're very illiquid compared to equities. And so that presents a set of empirical obstacles that we need to overcome. At least with respect to this, I'm mostly agnostic, but I'm leaning more in the direction in this bond book to market anomaly that I'm going to talk about now towards a behavioral explanation. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, one is that Book, bond book to market is a very stable trait. It doesn't change much over time. Um, and on the other hand, we find that this bond book to market anomaly dissipates very rapidly if you implement the signal with uh, some s relatively small delay. Um, I think that is more indicative of arbitrageurs finding some of these mispriced bonds and correcting the prices of those mispriced bonds than it is about some omitted risk or liquidity uh, explanation. Also, the efficacy of the signal I'm going to talk about uh, happens to be about the same for bonds of varying degrees of risk, credit risk, for example, and varying degrees of uh, liquidity. Uh, like the equity book-to-market ratio, the bond book-to-market ratio anomaly is more uh, prominent for bonds that are issued in small quantities. Um, and um, finally, we've created in this paper a factor, uh, something analogous to HML for equity that Fama and French creation created, a bond HML ratio. And we find it really doesn't diminish the efficacy of the signal I'm going to talk about. Um, the profitability uh, that we find for bond book to market does not, it's not large enough to beat the transactions costs of uh, implementing the strategy, uh, which may be an explanation for why these bonds seem to have these so-called off-market prices. Um, but if you actually do a buy and hold implementation and you have uh, the trading cost that an institutional investor would experience, uh, you find that you can get significant 
differences between the returns you earn from the signal and the trading costs that you would incur. All right, so um, one of the things that's unique about this data, I think this is the first study to really use uh, all transaction returns, all trace data. Most of you know that uh, since the early 2000s, there is uh, a data source trace which covers pretty much the universe of trades in corporate bonds. And other people have used the trace data set, but always with filters that have uh, perhaps some bias attached to them. This is the first study because of some methodological innovations we've come up with in the paper that I think really uses all trace transactions. There's no censorship that would bias the data, although there are data filters. For example, we focus, as do most of the studies in this arena, on uh, bonds that are what I would call traditional bonds. They're senior bonds, they're unsecured, and if they have options, they're just the simplest options attached to them. They're, they're ca simple call options that usually are what we call make whole options, which have minimal uh, impact. We've also studied, of course, call features within this, and that has no effect. Um, some of you may have to help me because I can't even read my slides. Uh, the data uh, is, gives you the transaction date, uh, the data is uh, pretty much complete, at least as of the date we wrote up the paper, uh, from the earliest days of Trace, uh, February 2003, all the way through September 2020. Uh, there's a six-month period of Trace that we're using because we've got a six-month momentum control uh, in there. In all, we end up with uh, about 460,000 bond month observations that we're going to study the returns of and try to see the degree to which risk, liquidity, uh, and behavioral explanations account for uh, those returns. How large is this sample of 460,000 bonds or so? Well, there is a words trace monthly return database. Uh, our sample is about 30% larger than that words uh, monthly return database which measures monthly returns from prices and uh, from transactions that occur only in the last five trading days of the month. If you were to actually do this akin to the way we study equities, which is focused on trades on the last uh, trading day of the month, you would actually cut the sample down by more than 75%. So there's quite a bit of censorship in focusing only on the liquid bonds that trade in the last day or the last few days of the month. We're going to eschew all that. Uh, we are going to uh, look at um, data from the in interaction, the intersection of the enhanced trace database with another database that's very standard in the literature that gives all kinds of other details about the bond, like the issue price, the credit rating, the maturity, uh, and uh, what the coupons are. All right, so here's the innovation that I think allows us to study all trace transactions subject to what we're interested in, which is these senior unsecured bonds. And we also eliminated bonds that, are, that come from financial firms because they're kind of structured around leverage and they would dominate the results. So we're, we're focusing on non-financial firms issuance here. All right, the hash marks that you see uh, in this here and here denote month beginning and month end. So here's the beginning of month T, here's the end of month T, here's the beginning of month T, here's the end of month T plus one. What I'm gonna talk about is a signal from what I call bond book to market, defined shortly, that occurs sometime in month T from a transaction, because bond book to market's something that involves the price, and then I'm gonna look at the return in month T plus one. So this hypothetical example here has three consecutive transactions in the bond, one that occurs in month T, and two transactions that occur in month T plus one. It's possible the signal could come from prior to month T. That's relatively infrequent, but I'll show you shortly a slide, I'll call it Lubos's slide, on what happens 
uh, if we have very illiquid bonds and only one transaction here or if we have uh, transactions that occur prior to uh, uh, month, uh, month T uh, for the signal. But the key thing here is that there's going to be some separation between the trade that's used for the signal and what I call the beginning price for the return of the bond in month T plus one. Both prices come from month T plus one when I'm focusing on the return, the beginning price and the ending price. Now here's the key innovation, at least, for this study. I avoid bid-ask bounce and other common sources of covariation between the signal and the return by making sure there's at least eight days between the signal date at which I use a transaction for computing the signal and the beginning of the month at which I am looking at the return, which is between the hash marks. I'm going to use intramonth prices in T plus one as if they were the beginning and end of month prices in computing the return. Now, re bonds report their prices on trace differently than stocks do. The price that is reported on trace is what's sometimes called uh, the flat price or the clean price. That's not the price you pay for the bond. For those of you who are unfamiliar with bonds, you'd be surprised when you buy from a broker at a price you actually pay more. You have to pay accrued interest on top of that. And of course, returns also include any coupons that would be paid in the bond. So in the formula for the return, this is pretty standard in the literature, we're talking about, again, price received at the end of the month divided by price paid at the beginning of the month, which includes accrued, and any cash you earn from holding the bond over the month uh, minus one. So the way to think about this is the returns are really full month returns. And all I'm doing is imputing the prices from transactions that are occurring intra-month T plus one to get me the beginning price right here and the ending price right here. I'm using, in some sense, the martingale property of efficient asset prices adjusted for risk and the time value of money and trying to make the argument that for bonds, it's a pretty good approximation or it's just white noise to use this transaction price right here and this transaction price right here. Now, wait a minute, you're going to say, Mark, that can't possibly be true. Uh, think about a government bond that starts out, and usually these bonds are issued at close to par, close to 100, and all of a sudden interest rates go up, and as the yield to maturity goes up, the bond price falls. So you say, all right, well, this bond is, it now has a flat price of 90. But we know, since government bond, it's going to end up at 100. So it's going to appreciate. What's that going to do to my return computations? Well, I'm going to split these bonds by their bond book to market ratios into quintiles. And I'm going to end up buying the high bond book to market bonds and shorting the low book to market, bond book to market bonds. And in the case of the bonds that have depreciated in value, those tended up in, in quintile five, high bond book to market. And those bonds tend to appreciate. The premium bonds tend to be in quintile one, those tend to depreciate. So I don't really have a martingale, but if I was actually to adjust this for the time value of money, the Q5 bonds, those with, that are the value bonds, would actually have a higher return than I'm computing. And the Q1 bonds, the ones that I'm shorting, would actually in reality have a lower return than I'm computing. So the numbers that I give you for the spread between the high bond book to market bonds and the low bond book to market bonds understates what's really the true return if I had the price. Now, you might say, well, I got noisy prices and I got some noise in the denominator of this return computation. Yes, there's a Jensen's inequality effect, but I'm mostly going to be looking at spreads. The spreads actually uh, associated with this Jensen's inequality uh, bias kind of wash out. And, uh, and they're also relatively small. The typical number of days between this transaction and the beginning of the month is like two days. 
a, a, a typical corporate bond in our sample of senior unsecured bonds with simple options that don't come from financial firms, you know, they, tr they trade on average one and a half times a day, which doesn't mean they trade every day. They, there are often many transactions in one day, then there's no transaction for five more days, and then there's another transaction. So in the end, for example, if the, you force to sample to have just the last trading day have a transaction, you're going to lose 75% of the bonds. And who knows what biases you're going to introduce. All right, let's talk about what bond book to market is. All right. Um, so uh, I've talked about the Martingale. Uh, I've talked about, um, I'm going to walk off this for a moment. Um, oh, I didn't talk about defaulted bonds. I am not censoring defaulted bonds in any way, shape, or form in this study. At the time I received the signal, which you remember from the prior slide is month T, if the bond is in default, you know, as of that at least prior month, at least eight days before the uh, end of the prior month when the signal comes from, but well before the return is computed, I'm not interested in those bonds. That, that again starts getting into the equity world of I don't know how to value these things. But that's not biasing anything, that's just, I'm still focused on a trading strategy. I'm focused on a trading strategy in bonds that at the time the input for the signal is computed are not in default. Now, if bonds go into default, I'm keeping track of their prices. And I'm actually, for any bond that goes into default that has any price at any time in the future, it's in our sample. So there's no bias associated with the prices of defaulted bonds. In fact, I do one better. All the bonds that default, and by the way, that's 0.02% of the sample of the bonds that are in quintile five, and there are no bonds in quintile one that default. Uh, for those bonds, what I'm going to do is use the price prior to the beginning of the month, prior to default, prior to the signal where the bond is not in default as my beginning price for the return, and my ending price for the return is going to be the defaulted price, plus I'm going to add a crude to the beginning price and not to the ending price. So I'm putting a huge penalty on defaulted bonds in quintile five. Again, if I had the actual returns, because defaulted bonds aren't going to follow a martingale, but if I had the actual returns, those returns should be, on average, larger than the ones I'm using for the defaulted bonds. But in reality, it doesn't make a difference. 0.02% of the sample is, is not going to affect our results. All right, so what is bond book to market? Well, it's just like equity book to market. You take the book value of the bond, and you divide it by the market value of the bond. Well, what's the book value of the bond? The book value of the bond is the issue price, which typically is around 100 par, but it could be 98, could be 99, could be, in some cases, 80. And then the book value amortizes linearly towards the uh, face value of the bond uh, uh, at maturity. So uh, you, in some sense, bond book to market is a lot like the bond's price, it's not quite the bond's price, and if you use a bond book to market signal, you get a slightly bigger uh, spread between value bonds and, I guess you'd call them growth bonds, the Q1 bonds. Uh, if you use price, you also get a significant signal here as well. It's just not as efficacious a signal as bond book to market. All right. So here's the issue prices uh, of these bonds in our sample. Again, there's two samples that we're going to look at. One is what we call the senior unsecured bonds. That's the primary sample. But as a robustness test, I also take all the bonds in trace and try and do the same thing. And you can see that the vast majority of these bonds are issued at very close to par. Uh, and uh, the same is true even when we look at the, the full bond sample. In terms of the Martingale property, which is the lower half uh, of this uh, slide right here, uh, you can see that the distance between the signal 
transaction date. Again, I'm implementing this at the end of month T, the beginning of month T plus one, but I'm using a slightly stale signal. I want that eight day gap because sometimes bond trades get split and so forth. That signal is a minimum of eight days. And then when you're looking at the median, that says, well, it's three more days until the transaction occurs you know, for the median. But in some cases, the signal's so stale, it's 37 days or 80 days, and even larger with the junior bond sample. All right. Here's the efficacy of the bond book to market signal. These are just returns equal weighted and evaluated. Both, these are, uh, you can think of this as basis points uh, per month if you multiply uh, by 100. There's about a 40 basis point spread uh, between the equal weighted value bonds, high BBM, and uh, low BBM bonds, and the value weighted also uh, seems to be monotonic, slightly smaller spread, not a huge difference um, between the equal weighted and the value weighted. So now the question is, looks like all the actions primarily happening in these Q5 bonds, these high BBM bonds, surely this must have something to do with credit risk something to do with default. Well, I already told you why it doesn't have anything uh, to do with default. It also doesn't have anything to do with liquidity. This is what I call Lubosch's slides. What I've done here in the orange is plot the bonds that have only one trade in the month we compute the return. For those bonds, I just say the flat price return is zero and I add a crude to that and I've assigned for those one trade bonds a return of, a flat price return of zero, and the blue is the all bond sample. And one of the things you see is that the bonds that have only one trade in the month in which I compute the return, and therefore don't have really what we would traditionally call a return, actually this is computed from the beginning price being the signal to the price to the ending price being the uh, price that we see in the last transaction of the month, the only transaction of the month in the case of the orange uh, uh, bars, that the orange bars have a bigger spread than the blue bars. Now there's a market microstructure bias. These spreads are much larger than the ones I had before because I'm using the signal price, which points out the need for things like the eight day gap that I have in the returns I'm gonna show you slowly. But there's other things I've looked at as well. There's really nothing about the Martingale procedure, thinly traded bonds, or anything that's explaining these results. All right, so to control for risk, I'm gonna throw in, as I have done in other research, the kitchen sink. Uh, and I'm gonna enter most of these controls uh, non-parametrically, usually by assigning quintiles. I've done this with deciles in earlier drafts of the paper. Results are even stronger in, in some of those cases. And, uh, and there are results in the paper that involve the parametric versions of the controls. But you can see I've got everything in, in there pretty much. I've even got the bonds yield to maturity uh, broken up into quintiles, which is a proxy for his expected return when broken up into quintiles because the promises of the highest quintile of yield to maturity, other things equal, are less likely to be met than the lowest ones. We've got coupon, we've got age, we've got bond value, and so on. All right. So we've also got a whole bunch of stock characteristic controls, primarily the things that influence stock returns. And we've got a whole bunch of market microstructure controls, including the number of trades in the month. Actually, in the bond controls, I've got the, bond, the individual bonds bid-ask spread. Uh, I've got uh, you know, everything you can imagine as a control. All right, so here are four specifications of the Fowler Macbeth regression from the paper, and I don't have enough space on this slide to show you all the controls, so I'm just showing you what the effect on the Q5 version of the control is, as well as the key one, which is in red, which is the bond book to market. The omitted dummy here is Q1 for each of the controls, as well as bond book to market. The first specification has uh, just industry controls. There's about a 44 basis point spread between Q5 and Q1. Uh, 
Uh, it's not really affected very much when we put in the market microstructure controls. They don't really matter. Uh, bond controls do matter. Uh, you get ab uh, about uh, 27 basis points per month spread, highly significant. And when you put in the equity uh, controls, you end up with a spread of uh, 32 basis points. I think I read that, right? All right. Some robustness uh, checks. Same thing, orange, uh, the, this box represents the difference controlling for everything else between the high book to market and low book to market bonds. Uh, the first column uses parametric control. So rather than using quintiles here, I actually put in the values of these things. Uh, the second column here says what would happen if I used the signal that I compute from trace but I use Merrill Lynch end of month quotes, something people often do is just take quoted quotes from dealers on these things. Again, you know, you get a highly significant bond book to market effect. If you use Merrill Lynch for both the signal and the returns, you again have this bid ask bounce bias attached to this and not surprisingly, you find a much larger spread between the high book to market and low book to market bonds. Uh, then I said, well, so this is really impervious even to structural models. What I've done here is for each bond in the sample, I've calculated what Merton's model would say its equity hedge would be, and I've subtracted off that beta, that hedge ratio, times the own equity return of that bond, and once again, you can see even with structural models, it doesn't matter. If I just try and predict the equity return itself from bond book to market, there's no predictability there. And if I take only bonds that have a signal, this is sort of mislabeled column, only have a signal from the, uh, some, uh, from the prior month, I still get the same effect. This has nothing to do with the fact that signals are stale for some reason or there's some weird long-term reversal going on. Also studied this with factor models. Sort of the latest, greatest factor model is the Bai Bali Wen model, which has five factors uh, attached to it. It seemed to miss also some control for the term structure of interest rates. So we've added just one factor to it, and we call it the augmented BBW factor model. And then an earlier draft of the paper basically took all the factor models in the literature that were popular, combined all their factors together, and that's what I call a 21 factor model. All right, so here is the results equal weighted and evaluated with the uh, augmented six factor by Bali Wen model. 23 basis points is a spread. This is the intercept, the alpha, in a time series regression on these six factors. Evaluated, it's 177 base, uh, uh, sorry, 17 basis, 17.8 basis points a month. Uh, and again, both significant. The reason I think this is more likely to be behavioral than some omitted risk factor, aside from the fact that I'm my own worst enemy at trying to find these things, one minute, is the fact that this effect decays so quickly. Bond book to market's a very stable trait. Once you're in Q5, you stick there. So if it's risk, you ought to see this effect diminish much more slowly than we observe right here. Secondly, I've also done this uh, both with liquidity measures and what you see here, default measures. I've used interaction terms with both nearness to default uh, and the bond rating. Uh, the interaction terms have virtually no effect. High liquidity, or in this case, high default risk bonds have the same BBM effect as low default risk bonds. Um, treasuries, we've done this with treasuries, looked at their bond book to market, no effect. And even when I assign treasuries sister corporate bond transactions, so they have the same illiquidity, sparseness in their data set, this was done over thousands of simulations, you still find that there's no effect if you try and look at this bond book to market for treasuries. It only exists 
for corporate bonds. And uh, this is what happens if you don't have the filter for the traditional bonds, the senior unsecured bonds, and use all bonds. You get an even larger effect uh, across the board in the four specifications I showed you for Fama and Beth. Uh, if you do this with the factor models, uh, you find out that there's a 48 basis point uh, spread with the six factors for all bonds. And if you put in a bond HML factor, constructed in kind of the same two by three way that Fama and French did for the equity one, again, you still get significance. That's remarkable because if I had constructed, oops, what did I do? If I had constructed this with just quintile five minus quintile one as my HML factor, as a mathematical theorem, you should get zero alpha. So I, Fama and French fuzz this up a bit with the way in which they construct these things, large and small, and three different categories uh, of book to market. We've done the same thing with bonds. That's fuzzed up enough, and you still get this bond book to market effect. Finally, I want to say, and this is kind of the last empirical slide, there is uh, no difference between uh, dealer to dealer bond book to market effects and dealer to customer bond book to market effects. What this means is dealers who might offer favorite pricing to some customers, that's not explaining this kind of thing. So if you're JP Morgan and you love PIMCO and you always give them a better price, for the bid and the ask. If you think that's dominating the data, what this is telling you by the virtue of the fact that all these are insignificant is that theory isn't true. That was Gene Fama's theory to me. Uh, you still have a bond book to market effect. So that's about it. I think I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much, and I very much look forward to my friend Jonathan's comments. <laughs>